Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Glasgow Times News Podcast, normally recorded in our studio at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre, currently recorded from our volunteers' homes. To keep in touch with us, use our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, which are all at Q and Review. That's C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. Or get in touch via information at qandreview.com. That's information at c-u-e-a-n-d-r-e-v-i-e-w.com. Please like and share our podcast and give us any constructive feedback. From the Glasgow Times, Thursday the 22nd of September 2022, from the news section. Country Living magazine Christmas Fair comes to Glasgow. By Rebecca Newlands. A popular Christmas event is returning to Glasgow's SEC. The Country Living magazine Christmas Fair returns to the city venue with a variety of stalls and workshops to give guests everything they need for a perfect festive season. Hundreds of UK designers, makers and boutique businesses will offer their selections of gifts, decorations, crafts, food and drink and interior ideas. Accompanying the festive atmosphere will be live entertainment and refreshments from the Champagne Bar. Those looking for inspiration on what to get their children this year can take a look at handmade traditional wooden toys, soft toys, knitwear, pyjamas, party dresses and more. Meanwhile, foodies can sample and purchase traditional festival delicacies such as gourmet sausages and hams, local cheeses and pâté, Christmas cakes, puddings, chocolates and mulled gins. The fair will run at the SEC from November the 17th to the 20th. Advanced booking of tickets is recommended. This article was by Rebecca Newlands from the Glasgow Times, Thursday the 22nd of September 2022, from the news section. Old Kilpatrick food parcels went from serving 57 families in February to 458 in August. Exclusive by Kirsty Fierick. A food bank is struggling to keep up with a surge of demand for its services. Old Kilpatrick food parcels went from serving 57 families in February to 458 in August. The charity revealed the devastating figures to the Glasgow Times, stating it never saw this coming in a million years. It is now desperate for help, with only half the packages they sent out last month coming from donations. Boss Maureen Cummings, 55, also confirmed that many families they help are working but still struggle to get by. It comes as a cost of living crisis has plunged the country into the worst economic crisis since the 1970s. With household bills set to skyrocket even further from October after Ofgem raised the energy price cap by 80%, The West Dunbartonshire Food Bank fears the numbers will continue to spike as the colder months come in. Maureen said, I couldn't have predicted these high figures coming to us for help. Never in a million years did I think this would be happening. There are so many working families that have been coming in, so upset because they've never imagined they would be in this situation. We are worried things will just get worse with this cost of living crisis, but we'll continue to help anyone who needs us. We are seeing a lot of carers and some taxi drivers who need help. Their wages just won't stretch to the end of the month. Beauticians and young mums are needing support also because people can't afford treatments when they have these huge bills to pay which cut their hours. People are having to put their pride aside with the current costs and just ask for help. It can be so hard for them and we want to make it easier. Old Kilpatrick food parcels were set up by Maureen and her husband in 2020 during lockdown, as she and Gordon, 56, wanted to help their community. They began delivering prescriptions, but noticed there was also a need for food and grew their mission. Now the pair have fed more than 14,000 people and are desperate to keep helping those in need. This year saw them provide for 61 households in January, 57 in February, 107 in March, 283 in April, 364 in May, 384 in June, 229 in July, and 458 in August. They also fed 301 pets in August, 
as people were willing to spend their last penny on their animals. It is believed that summer saw a slight dip as the cost of living payment was given out in July. Old Kilpatrick Food Parcels is now preparing to help more people than ever, as well as breaking down the stigma around using a food bank. There's no criteria that users must meet before being helped, as its open-door policy is available to anyone who asks. It also doesn't use a queue system for parcels, but has instead created a cafe area where people can have a free sandwich and cup of tea while they wait. Maureen explained, It takes someone quite a bit of courage to walk through the door and say they are desperate for help. They feel embarrassed, but we try to put them at ease and show them our cafe where they can sit with a free lunch and talk about their situation. It is better than having a queue because it makes people less intimidated and is more dignified. We have a very open door policy. We don't have any criteria at all as we help anyone who comes in, no matter what their situation. I think a lot of people are struggling and don't have the confidence to ask for help. They see it as a terrible thing, but they aren't doing anything wrong. Everyone needs help at some point in life, so let us break that stigma down and come see us if you need support. The food bank is looking for donations, including men toiletries, dinners, desserts, pet food and money. You can donate through its Amazon wish list or visit the hub at Unit 5, Industrial Estate, 5 Station Road, Old Kilpatrick, Glasgow, G60, 5LP. That article was by Kirsty Fierig. From the Glasgow Times, Thursday the 22nd of September 2022. Renting crisis. University of Glasgow students warned not to enrol amid lack of housing. Exclusive by Emma Sadlak. Students looking to take their place at one of Scotland's oldest universities have been instructed not to enrol in their courses if they do not have housing secured amid an intense demand for flats. Despite securing a place at Glasgow University, students could miss out on their top choices due to a lack of assured places for them to live, exclusively reports our sister title, The Herald. A spokesperson for the university, which is one of Scotland's four ancient universities and the fourth oldest university in the English-speaking world, said a significant contraction in the private rental market meant that they could not guarantee accommodation. There has been no significant rise in the number of students attending the university, which has also increased rooms for students by 25%, yet some have also been advised to pause their studies. Those that have enrolled describe gruelling searches which have left them short of hope and embroiled in bidding wars. Master's student Louise Gorse, 23, has been on the hunt for a one-bedroom property she could share with her partner since June, before starting her course at Glasgow University. Knowing she would need accommodation from September onwards, the couple believed that three months would give them ample time to find a flat. We have tried to get a viewing for every flat that has been put up that is under £700, the student said, revealing that she and her partner would be happy with a two-hour walk to university and extending their search to the outskirts of the city. Despite inquiring for upward of 50 flats, they only managed to, to secure four viewings during the summer-long search. We've still not found anywhere, she said. The main issue we are having is just the massive demand. I can't say I'm hopeful, the student and living rent member added. The student's course has now started, leaving her to commute from Edinburgh, where the couple have been temporarily living with her boyfriend's parents. One flat, first advertised on a Saturday afternoon, had received over 215 inquiries by the time the letting agent opened its office on Monday morning, she said. Despite sending an inquiry on a Saturday evening and calling at 10am on Monday, she did not get to view the flat. But it is not just demand that has been halting the flat search. Blanket bans on taking in students is also an issue, especially when the university itself has warned there was no guaranteed accommodation. Some letting agents have also started including a proposed rent box on the application forms to suggest a monthly figure above the one that was advertised, pushing modestly priced properties out of reach. The letting agent said that because of demand being so high, some tenants have been offering to pay more than the advertised rent. 
I don't know whether this comes from the letting agency or the landlord, but the letting agency said so many people have been doing it that they've had to put the box on the form. It seems very wrong, she added. You're being outbid, and sometimes this is without even viewing the flat. Alongside bidding wars, she said, lots of places have been going to people who pay three months' rent in advance. So thousands of pounds up front, which obviously not all of us are in the position to do. The whole point of renting is that you don't have to pay this massive upfront fee, otherwise everybody would just buy. Renting is for people who get their income every month and then spend it on rent. It just completely defeats the purpose of looking for somewhere to, to rent. She added, there has to be some regulation to it. A councillor, himself experienced issues finding a rented property, said it was incredibly disappointing to see the universities essentially lure, invite and coerce people to come to study without being able to provide housing. Green's councillor for Newlands and Aldburn, Leathers Massey, said the lack of student accommodation that is affordable and available has a massive impact on the rental market for everybody. It's obviously not the student's fault, he said. I find it even harder to try and get a long-term tenancy because there's a massive influx of students. In a normal world, first-year students would have student accommodation that's affordable and it should be available to move into. At the moment, it's neither affordable nor available to a lot of them. The National Union of Students, NUS, in Scotland, said the lack of housing is deeply concerning. NUS Scotland President Ellie Gomesall said, I am deeply concerned by continued reports of student housing shortages across Glasgow, the second year in a row that this has happened. NUS Scotland's Broke survey, published earlier this year, found that 12% of students in Scotland had experienced homelessness since they began their studies. With cost of living rising and without any action from institutions and the Scottish Government, I cannot see how student homelessness won't go up this year. We are delighted that the Scottish Government has heeded NUS Scotland's calls for a rent freeze, but we now urgently need a long-term student housing strategy that ensures every student has a safe, affordable and quality home. A Glasgow University spokesperson said, Regrettably, due to a significant contraction in the private rental market, demand for rooms continues to be substantially ahead of expectation, both in Glasgow and more broadly across the UK. Like most urban universities, we cannot guarantee accommodation for returning students. As part of our efforts to address the issue, we have increased the number of rooms under university management by 25% for this academic year. We have focused, as is our usual policy, on providing accommodation to first-year undergraduate students who live at a significant distance from our campus. There has been no significant increase in student numbers for this year. To address issues with the availability of accommodation within Glasgow, we are already taking steps to increase accommodation provision for future years, and we are continuing to engage with private providers and with local government on issues with the city's private rental market. We understand the concern students have about finding accommodation for the new semester and we are taking a number of actions to support our students and ensure continuity of learning wherever possible. In some cases, our advice may include pausing studies for this academic year while ensuring students continue to have access to university systems and services. Comprehensive advice is available from Students Advisors of Studies and the Student Representative Council Advice Centre. If you have been experiencing issues in trying to rent in Glasgow or Scotland, email Emma Sabliak, E M A dot S A B L J A K, at newsquest.co if you want to show your story. From the Glasgow Times of Thursday, the 22nd of September 2022, from the opinion section, Susan Aiken, Council is rising to fresh challenges in the new era. These have been an extraordinary couple of weeks. The passing of Her Majesty has brought to a close the longest reign of any monarch in the history of these islands, one characterised by an unwavering devotion and dedication to service. 
The Queen's funeral on Monday was a historic landmark. Like millions across the world, many thousands of Glaswegians will have marked the occasion with solemnity and reflection. Many others will have simply chosen to witness one of the biggest public events in their lifetime unfold before them. Scotland was special to the Queen and she made many visits to Glasgow from a young princess at the Empire Exhibition in the 1930s through to her memorable opening of the Commonwealth Games in 2014. Her recognition of the warmth of our people gave many Glaswegians a particular sense of pride in that particular moment in our city's history. I want to take this opportunity to give my thanks to some of those who have ensured Glasgow and indeed Scotland have been able to pay their respects to the Queen. Members of staff from the Neighbourhoods, Regeneration and Sustainability Department stepped up at short notice to answer a call to support the safe and timely procession of the Queen's final Scottish journey from St Giles Cathedral to Edinburgh Airport. The hour-long procession of the Royal Cortege was an enormous logistical undertaking and more than 100 members of the team provided support to marshal the procession safely. While much of the city stopped on Monday to pay its respects, the Council continued to provide the essential services required to support our most vulnerable citizens and to keep Glasgow going. I thank all our dedicated staff who kept doing their day jobs while the majority of the population observed the special bank holiday. I'd also like to give a special thanks to our Lord Provost, Jackie McLaren, and her team for the leading role they've played since the Queen's death. In her capacity as Lord Lieutenant, the monarch's representative in Glasgow, it's the responsibility of the Lord Provost and her officers to put in place the protocols for occasions such as this, as well as to formally represent the city in Edinburgh and London at the passing of the cortege and the funeral. Jackie and her office have done Glasgow proud. Within hours of Her Majesty's death, a book of condolence was opened to the general public and the front wall of the city chambers made a focal point for floral tributes. The Lord Provost also took a lead role in organising the proclamation of King Charles III in George Square and accompanied Princess Anne during her visit to the city chambers. I was glad to be able to have the opportunity then to directly offer my sympathies for the loss suffered by the princess and her family. Amid the very public mourning, this has of course been a personal bereavement for the Queen's family, which is one of the reasons why it has struck an empathetic chord with so many. Most of us have experienced a similar loss at some time in our lives. Of course there are many Glaswegians for whom, for a whole variety of reasons, the passing of the Queen does not feel relevant to their everyday lives, and others for whom it holds significance because it marks a potential turning point in how people across these islands think about the role of a hereditary monarchy in a modern democracy. Those feelings and viewpoints are as legitimate at this time as at any other and it's vital that people are free to express them openly. But there are also many thousands who are mourning her death and who feel a sense of personal loss. For generations of Glaswegians, she represented something constant, a fixed point of inspiration and reassurance in their lives. In paying our respects to the Queen, it's important that we seek to understand and respect the views of those whose reactions to this moment may not be the same as our own. Over the past fortnight, politics in Glasgow have been put on hold. On the Queen's passing, myself and leaders of the Council's other political groups took the decision that committees would not meet until after the funeral. The business of the Council, of politics and policies, resumes at a time of significant and multiple challenges. As we rise to meet those challenges, we do so in a new era. This article was by Susan Aiken.
from the Glasgow Times of Thursday the 22nd of September 2022 from the opinion section The Glasgowist Sign of the Times by Paul Trainer. Kieran Global is an artist and graphic designer defining the visual identity of many of Glasgow's most popular independent food places. He uses traditional sign writing tools and techniques to produce striking hand-painted works that have become distinctive features in neighbourhoods across the city, continuing a long-standing creative crossover between people involved in Glasgow's art, food and music scenes. Part of this determination to be different came from street food pop-ups and markets. A hospitality setting is often where collaboration would begin. He told me, I worked at Argyle Street Arches when it became platform and I recognised a lot of the people I met there. They were ex-art students or they used to be in a band. And then they will know other folk and there's this DIY ethos that runs through music, art and the hospitality world in terms of getting things done and making connections. Just about every artist I can think of in Glasgow has also worked in bars. Sometimes that's where they will find the people to start a project. I think being able to find folk to work with makes you realise that we're pretty good at doing our own thing and going our own way in Glasgow. We don't need to chase the tail of other bigger cities. Why should we? All you need to do is look at a list of artists or bands that this city has produced and that's your answer. This pronouncement turned out to be prophetic as his latest commission began with a conversation with the Clancy family that owns his local, the Lauriston. Kieran has created a series of throwback advertising signs turning the stone wall above the pub into a quirky new landmark. There had been some graffiti appearing on the stonework when the scaffolding had been put beside the railway track Because the stone was so old, the easiest solution was to paint over it. The first one was a sign for universal covers, as that was the business that used to be there back in the black and white times. It was a company that made waterproofs for your horse and cart. He calls the artwork throwback signs because they are not strictly ghost signs. The term for the faded imprints from businesses of the past that are often preserved or uncovered, they are modern variations on that theme. When the first sign was complete, they continued to crowdsource ideas around the pub and settled on a triptych of designs with a retro sign for the Glasgow District subway now on one side and a homage to the Lauriston's famous pie cabinet to complete the set. Kieran says much of his work lies with independent restaurants and cafes in the city. He feels connected to their success and hopes the signs help kickstart new businesses to attract attention. He works with artist Konzo Throb on larger scale mural projects, including sign writing Deniston on the side of Redmond's pub and an installation of Govan Hill lettering that represented the cultures in the neighbourhood. The global food and drink map of Glasgow signs include Lily Bakes Cakes in Partick, Rafa's Diner on the Hidden Lane in Finiston, Secret Tom's on Victoria Road, Good Times Roll in Govan, Tenants Brewery, Le Bon Accord, Julie's Copitiam and Philly's Bar. Kieran attempts to project the personality of a location as much as making the signs attractive. Sacred Tums and Rafa's to use two taco places as an example. It was the owners that had a vision of what they wanted the food to be and trusted me to come up with an aesthetic that matched it. I don't take it for granted that you have that level of input to what people see when they visit these places. 
I get to look at the menus up front and if the place goes on being a success, then you can take an element of pride in what they achieve. Street art is increasingly becoming a part of the urban realm all around us. Large-scale murals are the most important obvious examples, but the resurgence of interest in sign writing attempts to create an identity for local streets and add a colourful aspect to neighbourhood identity is one of the city's strengths. Let's continue to build, shape and create things in the Glasgow style. This article was by Paul Trainer. From the Glasgow Times, Friday the 23rd of September 2022, from the news section, Martin Compson happy to pay high tax as others struggle amid the cost of living crisis, by Christy Fiedek. Martin Compson is more than happy to pay high tax as people in Scotland struggle to keep their lights on. The 38-year-old Line of Duty star said, like everyone else, he doesn't want to fork out more cash, but in the current cost of living crisis, is keen to do his part. The celebrity said he was happy to be paying 46% tax on his TV earnings and said simply, those who earn more should be paying more. It comes as Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng announced the UK government is scrapping the 45p additional tax rate for the highest earners. The Chancellor of the Exchequer's move has faced a vicious backlash, including from the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, who said it would allow the super wealthy to laugh all the way to the actual bank. Compson took to social media to share his fears and tweeted, absolute disgrace during a cost of living crisis. Those who earn more should be paying more in periods like this. I don't want to pay more tax, same as anybody else, but when people are literally struggling to keep their lights on, I'm more than happy to be paying 46% here in Scotland. The cost of living crisis has plunged the country into the worst economic crisis since the 1970s. We recently reported how old Kilpatrick food parcels went from serving 57 families, families in February to 458 in August. The founder of the charity revealed the devastating figures to the Glasgow Times, stating she never saw this coming in a million years. She stated the cost of living crisis was forcing families in employment to ask for help as our wages aren't stretching across the month. Now Quartank has put an end to the top rate of income tax for the highest earners as he spent billions of pounds in a gamble set to increase growth. In a mini-budget, the cap and bankers' bonuses has been scrapped and restrictions to the welfare system are being added. He argued tax cuts are central to solving the riddle of the growth. Nicola Sturgeon tweeted, The super wealthy are laughing all the way to the actual bank though I suspect many of them will also be appalled by the moral bankruptcy of the Tories, while increasing numbers of the rest relying on food banks, all thanks to the incompetence and recklessness of this failed UK government. And that article was by Kirsty Fierick. From the Glasgow Times, Friday the 23rd of September 2022, from the news section, Nicola Sturgeon says super wealthy, laughing all the way to the bank after mini budget by Nicole Mitchell and Craig Payton. The super wealthy are laughing all the way to the actual bank, Scotland's First Minister has said, after the Chancellor unveiled plans he said would drive economic growth. Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng, announcing his so-called mini-budget on Friday, announced the scrapping of the top rate of income tax and the reduction of the basic rate to 19p in a pound. As a result of the income tax reduction and the cut, cut in stamp duty, the Treasury said the Scottish Government will receive £600 million over the three-year period covered by the 2021 Spending Review. The rise in national insurance proposed under Boris Johnson has also been cancelled, benefiting 2.3 million people in Scotland, the Treasury said. Mr Quarting also added restrictions to the benefit system and scrapped the cap and bankers' bonuses as he spent tens of billions of pounds to drive growth. The Chancellor said while an increase in jobs, wages and the public funding will not happen overnight, the statement sent a clear signal that growth is our priority. The fiscal strength of the UK government has allowed thousands of businesses in Scotland to keep more of their own money to invest, innovate and grow, he said. We are cutting national insurance for 2.3 million Scottish workers 
saving them an average of £285. And our Energy Relief Bill Scheme is protecting thousands of businesses across Scotland from rising energy costs with discounts of wholesale gas and electricity prices. In doing so, our growth plan sets the whole of the United Kingdom on the path for growth, building on the strength of our union and releasing the enormous potential of this country. But Nicola Sturgeon has taken aim at the plans, which she said on Twitter would benefit the rich while working people struggled. The super wealthy are laughing all the way to the actual bank, though I suspect many of them will also be appalled by the moral bankruptcy of the Tories, while increasing numbers of the rest relying on food banks, all thanks to the incompetence and recklessness of this failed UK gov, she said on Twitter. Deputy First Minister John Swinney, who is responsible for the finance brief while Finance Secretary Kate Forbes is on maternity leave, said the statement will be cold comfort to the millions of people across Scotland who have been looking for the UK government to use the reserve powers to provide support for those that need it most. Instead, we get tax cuts for the rich and nothing for those who need it most, he added. We estimate that the increase in the price cap to £2,500 will force an estimated 150,000 more Scottish households into extreme fuel poverty. Instead of offering these people support, the Chancellor is threatening to cut their family budgets further with a new regime of benefit sanctions. The growth plan, Mr Swinney said, will only lead to growth and inequality. He said that the Scottish Government would announce any changes to land and building transaction tax, LBTT, the Scottish equivalent to stamp duty, as part of the normal budget process, signalling no immediate changes will be made. The Deputy First Minister also pledged to keep discussing plans for special investment zones, but said the plans, which would provide tax cuts and more lax planning rules, would have to be the right fit for Scotland. Scottish Green Finance spokesman Ross Greer said the budget was for banks, the super rich and big polluters. It is targeting entirely the wrong things and will only serve to help the rich get even richer while punishing people on low incomes and those who rely on most on public services, he added. But Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack hailed the plans as ambitious, adding, A strong economy is the best way to tackle the cost of living challenges we are all facing due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Our plan for growth will support households and businesses in Scotland while driving economic growth to deliver jobs, investment and prosperity. The UK government is delivering for the people of Scotland when it really matters. In that article is by Nicole Bitchell and Craig Payton. From the Glasgow Times, Friday the 23rd of September 2022, from the news section, Three people to stand trial accused of hate crime at Glasgow student halls by Grant McCabe, court reporter. Three people are to stand trial charged with an alleged hate crime at student halls. Stephen Gray, Kyle Miller and Shannon Carrick are said to have assaulted a man at the accommodation in Donaskin Street in Glasgow's Partick on Monday. It is claimed the trio did repeatedly punch and kick him in the head and body to his injury. Prosecutors state that the alleged crime was racially aggravated. Gray faces a separate charge of acting in an aggressive manner towards the man, swearing and making a racist remark. Gray and Miller, both aged 22, as well as 18-year-old Carrick, denied the accusations at Glasgow Sheriff Court this week. A trial was set for next month. The trio all marked as the same address in Partick, were bailed meantime. And that report was by Grant McCabe. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 26th of September. Blue Lagoon owner speaks about becoming a Glasgow institution. An article written by Nicole Mitchell. When the owners of Blue Lagoon opened the doors to their first fish and chip shop on Socky Hall Street in 1975, their aim was to simply create a single successful chippy. However, in the 47 years since Ercilio Varese and his childhood sweetheart Edda opened the business, it's expanded to 15 branches and become a staple across Glasgow. Gianluca Varese, a grandson of Ercilio and Edda, is now a director of the family business, working alongside his father and two brothers, and puts their success down to their late opening hours, which saw them become a key destination at the end of a night out. Back in the day, I think we were one of the only places to open past midnight, selling food, and that's when they made the money up there with a the nightlife, he said. 
We realised that Glasgow was a great location for us, and then we opened other sites, then down at Argyle Street. We always get good feedback. Everyone seems to say that we're an institution because we've been here so long. While Gianluca says Blue Lagoon was fairly lucky during the pandemic because it remained busy with home deliveries, he says the biggest challenge the business is facing at the moment is skyrocketing electricity bills. He said, we've gone from paying in a shop in Queen Street £500 a week to £1,500 a week, so the profits in some of the branches have taken a massive hit, but thankfully we're still busy. Now that the office workers are back, at lunchtime we're getting busier again, which is a good help, and people are going out again, so although the cost of all the products we're buying has gone way up, things have returned to almost normal in terms of the trade and figures. Blue Lagoon recently reopened its Gordon Street branch following a large expansion, which saw it grow from a takeaway to a 70-seater restaurant after taking over the unit next door. Decked out in its now recognisable tropical theme, with a fishing boat taking centre stage in the middle, the restaurant has been grabbing the attention of passers-by. Jan Lucas said, The response has been fantastic. We've really been over the moon with that. At night time, many of our customers, and people in general, are walking past, taking videos of the shop. They're coming in because of the boat feature I designed for the centre that customers can sit inside. It's really grabbing the attention of the people walking past, and because there's a lot of LED and stuff in the shop, it really glows at night. Before the end of this year, Blue Lagoon is set to open its 16th shop on Renfield Street with a new 70-seater restaurant. As well as expanding the brand across Glasgow, Gianluca also says the company is looking to make a move to the East Coast next year. He revealed, in the pipeline we have another shop to open early next year in Ayr, and then we're always on the lookout in Edinburgh. We're desperate to get into Edinburgh. It would be great for the brand to be there, because we have a lot of customers that come to Glasgow and say, you've got to open one over there. We hear it all the time, so the customers are asking for it. And while Blue Lagoon has become a staple across the city, it's not just Glaswegians who enjoy their fish and chips. We've had Nigella Lawson in, Jan Lucas says. We've had many footballers over the time, Scott Brown and some of the Celtic and Rangers players. We've had Callum Best in a few times as well, and of course Justin Bieber was the most famous one. It created a lot of attention, and it was great for the business and the brand. The newly refurbished Blue Lagoon is located at 69 Gordon Street and is open from 8.30am daily. An article written by Nicole Mitchell. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 26th of September. Council agrees £2.1 million support package to help with cost of living crisis. An article written by Neil McGrory. Councillors have approved a financial support programme to help Eastern Bartonshire residents cope with the cost of living crisis. The council is to put £2.1 million of its financial reserves into the programme to fund a range of support measures, including winter fuel support payments, food vouchers, donations to food banks, welfare payments, energy vouchers, free swim and gym access, warm hubs in community facilities and grants for community organisations. A report on the proposal stated the cost of living crisis is having a significant impact across our communities. The cost of living is predicted to continue to increase during 2022, affecting many families and residents, making it more difficult for low-income households to make ends meet. The cost of living crisis is such that the First Minister has recently been quoted as saying the crisis is a humanitarian emergency which could cost lives. Although welcoming the proposals, Councillor Susan Murray said that during the 15 years the SNP had been in power at Holyrood, there had been no reduction in the number of Scottish children living in poverty and called for specific support to help older people as well as children and families. In response, Council Leader Gordon Lowe said that a number of the proposed measures would potentially support older people in eastern Bartonshire, especially the warm hubs and welfare funding, which is open to all eligible residents. Many older people are also council tenants. In terms of the council using its resources to do this, I think it's entirely right that all branches of the government should step up, he added. Councillor Vaughan Moody also welcomed the scheme, highlighting the free access to swimming could potentially help address the disruption to swimming lessons caused by the pandemic, 
while also creating demand which could benefit the Leisure Trust, which is also facing financial pressure. An article written by Neil McGrory. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 26th of September. School Uniform Bank Makes Winter Appeal An article written by Rebecca Newlands A Glasgow school uniform bank has made a plea to keep its service going as the cost of living crisis continues to put a strain on services. Glasgow's pre-loved uniforms, based on Govan Road, is facing increasing demand for uniforms as rising bills and costs have resulted in more and more families struggling to cope. The registered charity was originally founded in 2017 as Balornock Uniform Bank by Donna Henderson, who recognised a demand for the service in the area. It expanded as North Glasgow Uniform Bank, then became an official charity as Glasgow's pre-loved uniforms in 2020. The team made a plea to the community ahead of the winter months. In a recent post on Twitter, it said, We still need your support. All we're asking for is a donation of a pound to help keep our service going and to support the costs of our big winter jacket giveaway, which is more than just jackets. The plea comes just weeks after we exclusively reported that the city's uniform banks were facing up to triple the demand at the beginning of the new school year. Ms Henderson told the Glasgow Times, People are saying to us that they're just struggling with their bills going up and any wee bit of uniform they can get help with just means that they're able to pay other bills. The cost of living crisis has meant that families who previously never required the bank's assistance are now in need of the service, leading to very high demand. Ms Henderson added, There are people being refused clothing grants even though their circumstances haven't changed from last year. A lot of people think families automatically get a clothing grant, but you might be just a couple of pounds over the threshold, and so you've got the same bills to pay as maybe your next-door neighbour, but they're getting £150 per child, so they're better off than you are. While also encouraging people to use less waste by recycling clothes, the volunteers' main aim is to help families in Glasgow who are financially disadvantaged by providing them with clean, warm and comfortable second-hand uniforms. Ms Henderson said... All we care about is that children are wearing actual school uniforms so that everybody looks the same. It's important for children to fit in and be able to learn, and that way they do. An article written by Rebecca Newlands. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 26th of September. Pound falls to all-time low against the US dollar. An article written by Joshua Searle. The pound has fallen to an all-time low against the US dollar, potentially worsening the cost-of-living crisis, experts have warned. Market confidence in the pound has plunged following the announcement of the government's new economic plans, revealed last week. Plans included the biggest tax cuts in 50 years, and the Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng signalled more were on the way. Sterling hit its lowest level against the dollar since decimalisation in 1971, falling by more than 4% to just $1.03 in early Asia trading before it regained some ground to about $1.07 early on Monday. The euro also hit a fresh 20-year low amid recession and energy security fears, ahead of what is expected to be a painful winter across Europe as the war in Ukraine shows no sign of ending. Experts warned the pound's plunge towards parity with the dollar will send the cost of goods soaring even higher, potentially worsening the cost of living crisis, while it also means it will be more expensive for the government to borrow money. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves accused the Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng and the Prime Minister Liz Truss of recklessly gambling with the UK's finances. The Labour MP told Times Radio... Instead of blaming everyone else, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister, instead of behaving like two gamblers in a casino chasing a losing run, they should be more mindful of the reaction not just on the financial markets, but also of the public. She added, They're not gambling with their own money, they're gambling with all our money, and it's reckless and it's irresponsible, as well as being grossly unfair. Mr Kwarteng has previously brushed off questions about the market's reaction to his mini-budget, which outlined the biggest programme of tax cuts for 50 years, after it was announced on Friday using more than £70 billion of increased borrowing. He claimed on Sunday the cuts favour people right across the income scale, amid accusations they mainly help the rich. 
but financial markets continue to be spooked, and there are fears the Bank of England may even be forced to step in with an emergency interest rate hike to rein in soaring inflation fuelled by the tax cuts. An article written by Joshua Searle. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 26th of September. Public urged to use or exchange £20 and £50 banknotes before the deadline. An article written by Sarah Campbell. There's less than one week to go until paper versions of £20 and £50 notes will be removed from circulation in Scotland. The Committee of Scottish Bankers on behalf of the Royal Bank of Scotland, Clydesdale Bank and the Bank of Scotland has urged members of the public to spend or exchange any of their remaining paper notes before September the 30th. After that date, retailers may use their discretion to refuse paper notes. Issuing banks will continue to accept all Scottish notes from their customers, which can be deposited into their bank accounts. The Royal Bank of Scotland, the Clydesdale and the Bank of Scotland have also agreed that they will exchange their own paper £20 and £50 notes from non-customers up to the value of £250, provided that photographic identification is presented. Other banks, building societies and the post office may continue to accept and exchange Scottish paper notes after September 30th. A spokesperson for the committee confirmed, thanks to the work that the issuing banks have already undertaken to swap the older paper notes with the more secure, environmentally friendly polymer notes, the majority of £20 and £50 notes have already been replaced with polymer. We've set a deadline for using paper £20 and £50 notes as September the 30th. The Scottish note issuing banks will continue to accept old paper-based notes and there are currently no plans to change this. The withdrawal of Scottish paper notes coincides with the date of the Bank of England's withdrawal of Bank of England £20 and £50 paper notes. It's estimated that 90% of £20 and £50 notes currently circulating in Scotland are made of polymer, which is designed to last longer, remain in better condition and deliver more environmental benefits than its paper counterpart. An article written by Sarah Campbell. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 26th of September. University provides free breakfast for students. An article written by Rebecca Newlands. Students are being offered free breakfasts to help them with their studies in a new initiative. Better Breakfast Day is fueling hard-working students from the University of the West of Scotland with free breakfast meals twice a week. The offer is in place from 8.30am to 9.30am. As well as giving students a healthy start to their day, the university's interim principal and vice-chancellor, Dr Lucy Meredith, hopes the initiative will help as rising costs continue to impact people's finances. She said, with costs increasing in many areas of life, we're hopeful that this will make a small difference in ensuring our students are fueled up for the day ahead. Not only will they have a healthy kickstart to their day, but breakfast is known to positively impact learning and general health. Research shows the impact skipping breakfast can have on learning, and this initiative demonstrates our commitment to the mental and physical well-being of our students. Rebecca Grant, president of the Students' Union at the university, added, We're delighted to see the Breakfast Club launching at the university to support our students. It'll bring so many benefits and it's a great opportunity to catch up with classmates and students from the wider university community. An article written by Rebecca Newlands. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 27th of September 2022, from the news section. Energy bills discount scam warning ahead of off-gem price cap increase this week by Kieran Doody. A warning has been issued to anyone who pays energy bills in the UK ahead of the off-gem price cap increase in October. Scammers are looking to take advantage of the current financial climate and government support packages to dupe unsuspecting victims into handing over their personal details. One of the latest scams comes in the form of a text claiming to be an energy support scheme, although the scheme is fake and is run by fraudulent criminals. The scam text, which offers help amid the ongoing cost of living crisis, is sent under the name UK Help. The message reads, 
Gov UK, you are ineligible for a discounted energy bill under the Energy Bill Support Scheme. You can apply here. The text also includes a link including the word Gov as Britons worry about rising energy bills. This link does not take you to the government website and instead leads to a website where scammers can steal personal information and banking details. It's worth noting any text messages claiming to need details is a scam. You do not need to apply for the £400 rebate and the money will be paid automatically. A spokesperson for energy regulator Ofgem said it has recently asked all energy suppliers to ensure clear and up-to-date information on scams is easily accessible on their websites. The spokesperson said it is alarming that vulnerable customers are being preyed upon in this way when people are already struggling so much. We take these attempts to exploit consumers very seriously and work with the National Cyber Security Centre to prevent these malicious attacks. If people are unsure if anything is a scam, they should pause, check and don't let callers push you into anything. Genuine organisations won't mind you calling back. Only scammers apply pressure and insist you hand over details immediately. If you have any doubts about a message, consumers should contact the organisation directly and not use the numbers or address in the message. Use the details from their official website. That article from the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 27th of September 2022, from the news section. Eurovision Song Contest. Update expected on host city shortlist. An update on the Eurovision Song Contest host city shortlist is expected later today, according to the BBC. Birmingham, Glasgow, Leeds, Liverpool, Newcastle, Sheffield and Manchester form the current shortlist of potential cities to host Eurovision in 2023, in place of Ukraine. Speaking on BBC Breakfast on Tuesday morning, presenter Sally Nugent said, This morning, listen very carefully to what I am saying. After taking a look at how Manchester is hoping to secure the contest, Nugent, 51, said, As we said earlier, later on today we are expecting an update from the BBC. She added, as soon as we know, you will know. Ukrainian entry Kalush Orchestra triumphed at the 2022 competition in Turin, Italy. But the European Broadcasting Union, EBU, which produces the annual event, decided the show cannot be held in the country following Russia's invasion. The selected city will be crowned host of the 67th Eurovision Song Contest after the UK was given the chance to host the event for the ninth time, more than any other country, after Sam Ryder came second in the competition. The shortlist was narrowed down from 20 UK cities who initially submitted an expression of interest with applications across all four regions demonstrating how they would reflect Ukrainian culture, music and communities. Of the seven cities shortlisted, six are in England and one is in Scotland, with Belfast failing to make the cut for Northern Ireland. The cities have each been scored on a set of criteria, the BBC revealed. Requirements include a suitable venue and sufficient space to deliver the requirements of the song contest necessary commitment to the contest, including a financial contribution, and alignment with the BBC's strategic priorities as a public service broadcaster. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 27th of September 2022, from the news section. Hunt for masked men after three cars set on fire in Bray Head, by Rebecca Newlands. A hunt has been launched for a gang of masked firebugs who torched three cars. A Kia Sorento, a Mitsubishi Shogun and a Toyota Hayachi were set alight just before 1am on Tuesday the September the 27th. The cars were targeted in the King's Inch Road area of Brayhead. Emergency services rushed to the scene and fire crews extinguished the blaze. Now, officers are investigating the attacks and trying to track down four men. They were dressed all in black and wearing masks and were seen in the area before running off. Detective Constable Gary Bruce said, Fortunately, no one was injured, but three vehicles were extensively damaged 
and we are keen to speak to the men seen at the time. If you saw anything suspicious, or have dashcam or private CCTV footage that could assist with our ongoing investigation, then please get in touch. Anyone who can help with inquiries is asked to contact Police Scotland on 101 or call Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. This article was by Rebecca Newlands. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 27th of September 2022, from the news section. Pollockshaw's Road in Glasgow to close for nearly two months by Rebecca Newlands. A major road is to close for almost two months for work to be carried out. Pollockshaw's Road will be closed to traffic between Devon Street and Tarish Street from Wednesday, September the 28th. This is to undertake Scottish Power cabling connection work. The area will reopen on Wednesday, November the 23rd. Delays are to be expected during the closure and diversions will be in place. Drivers must follow the northbound diversion via Tariff Street, Eglinton Street, Cumberland Street, Lauriston Road, Cathcart Road and Pollock Shores Road. Southbound, the diversion will be via Devon Street, Eglinton Street and Tariff Street. This article was by Rebecca Newlands. From the Glasgow Times of Tuesday the 27th of September 2022, from the Opinion section, Thomas Kerr. This budget was on the side of working families. The past few weeks have been a bit of a whirlwind for me, as my partner and I come to terms that in February we'll be joined with our first child, a little boy. It's made me re-evaluate my priorities as I work to rebalance my life between work and family, but it's also got me wondering what kind of world my son will inherit. He'll grow up in a world with a new monarch, new prime minister and new opportunities. I've never been more optimistic about where our country is going than I am right now. As the Chancellor said on Friday, we enter a new era focused on growth, jobs and opportunities. That's what his mini-budget was all about, growth and opportunity. By cutting the taxes of millions of hard-working people, the UK government is reshaping how we look at economic policy. It really is out with the old and in with the new. Given the magnitude of measures that were announced, it was inevitable that there would be opposition politicians and other experts queuing up to come out against them. But I firmly believe that by cutting the basic rate of income tax, scrapping the planned rise in national insurance and lifting the stamp duty thresholds, our new Prime Minister has put herself firmly on the side of those struggling with the cost of living crisis. The ball is now in the court of other political parties. Labour at least have confirmed they wouldn't scrap the cut in the rate of basic income tax, but still appear confused as to their current position on national insurance contributions. However, the onus here in Scotland is on the SNP. With their control over income rates, income tax rates and bans, as well as land and building transactions tax, the equivalent of stamp duty, we here in Glasgow need to know whether we are going to benefit in the same way from these cuts. If they followed suit, then a tax cut would be passed on for 2.4 million Scots and many more across our city would be given an extra 2,100 to help get onto the housing ladder. As we grapple the cost of living crisis and businesses are hit with rising costs while just trying to get back on their feet after the pandemic, the SNP cannot let Scotland lag behind and allow our tax gap to widen even further between here and south of the border. The Prime Minister and Chancellor have acted decisively and put measures in place at haste to support those struggling to pay their energy bills and have now delivered a package of measures that have given a shot in the arm to our economy. That's why, despite ongoing anxieties about the war in Ukraine and inflation, I still feel optimistic about where our country is going. 
I look forward with hope and encouragement that the world my son will see is one of economic prosperity and full of wonderful opportunities that I could only have dreamt of growing up in Cran Hill. This article was by Thomas Kerr. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 27th of September 2022, from the news section. Thousands of workers at universities across Scotland balloted for strike action by Morgan Carmichael. Thousands of university workers across the country are being balloted for strike action over a pay dispute. Unite confirmed today that around 2,000 union members across 11 universities will have until October the 21st to have their say. As well as the University of Glasgow, Glasgow Caledonian University, Glasgow School of Art and the University of Strathclyde, Workers at the University of Aberdeen, Abertay University, University of Dundee, University of Edinburgh, Heriot Watt University, Edinburgh Napier University and the University of St Andrews are also being balloted. The staff involved include cleaners, janitors, estate staff and technicians. The Unite members are part of a UK national-wide pay dispute involving the University and College Employers Association, UCEA. Unite has rejected an offer amounting to 3.1% for some members. Sharon Graham, Unite General Secretary, said, The pay offer on the table from the UCEA is completely unacceptable at a time when inflation is 12.3%. The pay inequalities across Scottish universities are outrageous in a section which is totally dependent on public money. No university principal is facing a cost of living crisis, but our members certainly are, and this offer, which represents a massive pay cut, can only make that worse. They will have our full support in this fight for better jobs, pay and conditions. Peter Matheson, University of Edinburgh principal, is understood to have an annual salary around £363,000 while Anton Muscatelli earns around 368000 as principal of the University of Glasgow, according to the latest financial reports. Alison McLean, Unite Industrial Officer, added, The UCEA has refused to reopen pay negotiations, despite Unite and all trade unions arguing that they must come back to the table. A number of Scottish universities are also recognising that the offer is so poor that they are encouraging a new one to be made to the workforce. It's the first time ever that Unite is simultaneously balloting for strike action across so many Scottish universities, but that's a testament to the anger our members feel right now. Unite members at the University of Dundee are also on strike action in a separate dispute concerning pension cuts. That article was by Morgan Carmichael. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 28th of September 2022, from the news section, Drones and Laser Technology to Help Scottish Water Improve Sewer Network by Nicole Mitchell. State-of-the-art drones and lasers are being used together for the first time in Britain to improve Scotland's sewers and help Scottish water reduce its carbon emissions. The combination of high-tech drones and laser technology adapted for use in the wastewater industry, is being deployed by Scottish Water to survey sewers for potential problems by flying the drones inside them, often to parts of the network that traditional survey methods can't reach. The new techniques will allow the water company to more accurately assess the sewers' condition and make key decisions about investment in maintenance or rehabilitation work to improve them. This will, in turn, make the sewers more resilient, improve Scottish Water's service to customers, and reduce the risk of leaks, collapses and environmental pollution. Replacing teams of up to 15 workers with just two operatives using a drone and a light detection ranging scanning and measurement techniques, this will also help reduce carbon emissions from sewer surveys by as much as 80%, helping Scottish Water towards its target of reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2040. The bespoke drones will fly into sewers effectively replacing workers in challenging and dangerous underground conditions and will enable Scottish Water to survey its network of more than 33,000 miles of sewers more accurately, which will cut the cost of repairs and maintenance, reduce the risk of following and pollution, 
improve the utility's ability to target investment and enhance worker safety. The adaptive technology was used for the first time on a large brick sewer in Bath Street in Glasgow City Centre in July and is set to be rolled out to other locations across the city as well as Edinburgh, Aberdeen and some rural areas. Ian Jones, Risk and Life Cycle Planning Manager at Scottish Water said, This is the first time we've used drones adapted for sewers and LIDAR together for sewer surveys and we're really excited about it. We want to improve the accuracy of our surveys and, for safety reasons, we want to reduce the number of workers needed to carry out survey work inside, survey work inside sewers. The drone does both and it will also help us in our aim to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2040. Factors such as depth, flows and debris can significantly slow down a worker injury survey in a way that does not affect the drones. Because of the reduction in the number of workers involved, a large number of site vans and vehicle deliveries are not required and so carbon emissions are reduced. Shona Heron, Director of Environmental Techniques said, We've been working with Scottish Water, CWA and Good Friday Robotics on the, adap- on the adaptation of these cutting edge technologies to help maintain and improve the network of sewers under the streets of our cities and towns. The fact that it will also improve workers' safety and reduce carbon emissions is really important. And that article is by Nicole Mitchell. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 28th of September 2022, from the news section, Family's poignant tribute to Dad, 29, who died after suffering cardiac arrest, by Lauren Brownlee. The family of a young dad who died after suffering a cardiac arrest has spoken out following their heartbreaking loss. Joseph McGowan was looking forward to turning 30 in July, but in January, the 29-year-old was rushed to Inverclyde Royal Hospital after suddenly taking not well. From there, he was transferred to the intensive care unit, ICU, at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Paisley. At a special ceremony, Joseph's family, including his sons Ronan, four, and Isaac, two, handed a cheque for £4,709 to teams at the hospital as a poignant thank you for the quality of care he received. Joseph's mum, Anne-Marie McGowan, and his dad, John Ross, endured days of worry as ICU staff assessed his condition. However, after a week, the couple received the heartbreaking news that their son would not survive. Joseph's dad and I spent 11 days with him before he died, Anne-Marie from Port Glasgow said. The care our son received was wonderful. I'll never forget what the staff did for him. There was a nurse by his side all the time, and they were so good to us, so understanding. At just at Joseph's funeral, we asked that people didn't send flowers, but instead donated money to the hospital. We raised £505, which we've already handed over. But that was only the beginning. A little while later, nine of Joseph's friends walked the West, walked the West Highland Way to raise even more money, and I'm so proud that they raised nearly £3,000. Joseph's brother Jamie and Anne-Marie's friend Eleanor Leach then arranged a charity birthday party in memory of Joseph. The party was held at the Hibernian Hall in Port Glasgow and the proprietors provided the venue for free. So many people came, Anne-Marie said. I'm just so grateful to Jamie and Eleanor and to our friend Karen Hagen who baked such a lovely cake for the event. In fact, I'd like to thank everyone who donated raffle prizes and made the night such a success and all the people who dipped their hands into their pockets and gave money for the hospital. Guests of honour Ronan and Isaac were allowed to stay up late to go to the party. We felt it was important that the boys went, and Marie said. By being at the party, they were able to say happy birthday to their daddy. The boys don't really understand what's happened. All they know is that their daddy's in heaven. They're so young that they won't remember any of this, but we want them to know about the people at the hospital who helped their daddy, and about everyone who helped him in the hospital in return. We hope the pictures we've taken will help us do that. The staff at our hospitals don't get enough credit. They did so much for Joseph that that we just can't thank them enough. We just wanted to give something back. We'd like to thank Dr Patrick McGoey, who was so kind to us, as well as all of the staff in Ward 24. But we'd especially like to thank Mr David Gray and the End of Life team, and all the others who helped us. We will never forget them, 
and we just want to meet sure Ronan and Isaac never forget them too. And that article was by Lauren Brownlee. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 28th of September 2022, from the news section, Glasgow University students hit out as lectures held at the Wellington Church. Fed up students paying £19,000 a year to study at the University of Glasgow hit out at the decision to teach lectures in a church, which has no internet access. Subjects including politics and psychology are being taught at Wellington Church, a short walk from the Uni Library. Services are still being held at the Church of Scotland Church rather than lecture theatres, the news site The Tab reported. Timetables suggest the 19th century church, which has no internet access, will be used until Christmas. Lecturers are using the lectern while students complained of it being uncomfortable. Second year student Evan, who does a joint honours degree, told the student newspaper, The Tab, she has, she has had to spend two hours sitting in the wooden pews. She said, There's no Eduralam extension, student Wi-Fi, so I have to use my data in hotspot to take notes on my laptop, which sits on my knees since it doesn't fit on the tiny little ledge for the Bibles. When it's sunny, the light comes right through the stained glass and you can't see the projector screen. Love that I'm paying £19,000 a year as an international student for that. Another student said it was pretty cool and added, It was unexpected, but a nice twist. Alongside there being very little room to rest any laptops or books, students have said there are big queues to get into the church as the space, which can hold up to a thousand people, only has one entrance through which students can come in. The church... Website suggested it is still functioning as a normal church as well as an impromptu Glasgow University lecture theatre. There are still Bibles on the pews as students enter for their lectures and, on its website, the church invites people to join us for worship this Sunday. A spokesperson for the University of Glasgow said, Our ongoing campus redevelopment plan has recently added a state-of-the-art learning centre and the advanced research centre to our learning and teaching capacity. We are making use of a few teaching rooms close to campus, while refurbishment work is underway across our campus. And that article is unattributed. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 28th of September 2022, from the news section, Mum's agony after being told baby would be born with hole in his heart, and her thanks to Glasgow Medics. Exclusive by Amanda Keenan. A brave tot underwent life-saving open heart surgery at just four months old after being born with a hole in the vital organ. New mum Laurie Anderson carried son James to full term, knowing that the major operation was inevitable after being given a devastating diagnosis at her 20-week scan. Laurie, 29, and partner Daniel Moir, 31, were told their beautiful boy was suffering from a congenital heart condition known as Tetralogy of Fallot and requiring a gruelling seven-hour surgery to survive. The life-saving procedure was recently carried out by a team of highly skilled specialists at Glasgow's Children's Hospital, and the youngster has amazed medics with his incredible fortitude and recovery. Proud mum Laurie told the Glasgow Times, James is our little hero. He's battled through so much at such a young age, and we're all amazed at how quickly he has recovered after surgery. He was only four months old when he had the op and his heart team can't believe his progress. He really is a little fighter, we're just in awe of him. Laurie admits her pregnancy was a fraught one after discovering that James would be faced with such serious health issues. The couple were told by medics that open heart surgery was their son's only hope of pulling through. She explained, From the moment we found out something was wrong, we were consumed with fear and doubts. It was in the back of my mind that something could go wrong at any point, but thankfully his birth went smoothly. I was initially told medics would operate on him straight away, but he did really well and managed to reach the four month mark before having to go in. The life saving procedure was carried out on July the 27th. Knowing their little boy was in the hands of the country's top surgeons, the couple admit they were gripped by worry. Laurie said, The day of our son's surgery was the worst of our lives. Every minute felt like an hour, but the staff promised to call us as soon as he was out of theatre so we would know he was safe. All we could think about was being reunited with James. We first saw him in the ICU, and I'm so glad to say it was not as scary as I'd imagined. His nurse there explained every machine that was attached to him, and that made us feel like he was in safe hands. 
James left ICU after only 18 hours and spent the rest of his time in hospital on a ward. The toughest day for me was the one after his operation. I almost felt numb. I should have been so happy that this massive life-threatening sur- surgery was over and he was okay, but I couldn't shake this strange feeling. The senior nurse explained that since the 20-week scan, I had subconsciously prepared for the worst, for us to lose our baby, and now that he was recovering, my body and my brain couldn't comprehend that. She really helped me deal with my emotions, and I slowly began to relax and realise we had come out the other side and our boy was fixed. James, who is now seven months old, continues to make great progress and, as a thank you to the incredible staff, the couple have raised £3,350 for the Glasgow Children's Hospital charity. Laurie and Daniel, who were based in Glasgow for the surgery but now in Aberdeen, added, The hospital and staff saved our boy's life and we will be forever indebted to the team there. Glasgow Children's Hospital Charities has invested over £41 million in vital projects and support services for young patients, their families and the NHS staff who care for them. Children like James have benefited from the recent purchase of state-of-the-art fetal scanners, funded by the efforts of Barclays employees. The high, ultra-high resolution scanning equipment is worth £96,000 and detects heart issues before birth at the Royal Hospital for Children. Kirsten Watson, CEO of Glasgow Children's Hospital Charity, said, For 20 years we've been there to support families when a child is taken into hospital. Equally, we're here to support the amazing NHS staff who help families like James through some of their toughest times. When the people we've helped then decide to fundraise for us, it's amazing to see. The money raised will help future families through projects like our play programme, which keeps the wee ones distracted and at ease during the hospital stays. I just want to say thank you to Laurie and Daniel for raising such an incredible sum. And that article was an exclusive by Amanda Keenan. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 28th of September 2022, from the news section, section of Barhead Road in Glasgow to close by Rebecca Newlands. A section of a major Southside road is to close next week for works. Maintenance work has been carried out on the street lighting on Barhead Road for three nights, resulting in lane closures in the area. The road will be closed from the off-ramp junction of the M77 to the opposite of Maidland Road and from the Pete Roundabout to Crookston Road. Works will be completed from 8pm to 5am on Monday, October the 3rd, Tuesday, October the 4th and Wednesday, October the 5th. Drivers are urged to avoid the area during these dates and times. And that article is by Rebecca Newlands. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 28th of September 2022, in the news section, Teenagers take the leap in a 160 foot bungee jump for Who Cares Scotland? By Rebecca Newlands, digital journalist. Two East Renfrewshire teens took the leap in a 160 foot bungee jump for a cause close to their hearts. Molly Miller, 16, and Olivia Houston, 17, have been best friends since meeting at school and enjoy taking on thrilling new challenges. After hearing about the opportunity to take on a bungee jump while also raising money for an important charity, they, literally, jumped at the chance. The pair, both from Clarkson, leapt up over a, from a platform overlooking the River Clyde at the Riverside Museum on September the 24th in aid of Who Cares Scotland. Who Cares is an independent member organisation for anyone who has experienced care, such as foster care, kinship care, residential care and adoption, and has a close connection to Molly. She said, My mum started working there five years ago and she's always telling me about her work. It makes me proud hearing about the fantastic job she does to support care experienced people, especially now that she runs the helpline. Because of this, I've, re- I've done lots to raise money for them. This year, I've already done the Glasgow Kilt Walk and now being able to tick something off my bucket list while also raising money was really amazing. It was one of the best days of my life. Olivia added, We do everything together and when we heard about the bungee jump we thought it was an amazing way to have fun and, and do some good at the same time. Molly's mum, Carol Lynn, works at a helpline which advises people on issues such as rights, finances and more. It is open to anyone who has experienced care, supporting someone in care, or who works in the sector and needs support. Louise Hunter, 
Chief Executive of Who Care Scotland said, We're very impressed by Molly and Olivia's bravery and commitment to take such an exciting yet terrifying challenge on behalf of Who Care Scotland. Their efforts will support valuable initiatives like our helpline to provide a lifetime of equality, respect and love for care experienced people. We're glad their work has resonated so strongly and are incredibly thankful for their efforts and would value any support you can show them. Olivia said, We're hoping to raise £500 and we're we're about three quarters of the way there. We'd really appreciate any support and we'd be super grateful for any donations. If you would like to support Molly and Olivia, you can donate to their fundraising page online at justgiving.com slash fundraising slash molly hyphen miller hyphen olivia hyphen houston and that report was by Rebecca Newlands. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 28th of September 2022, in the news section, three men faced jail over sophisticated drug making operation in Glasgow by our court reporter. Three men are facing lengthy jail terms after police swooped on a massive cannabis factory. Keith Gartshore, 42, Ross Blackshaw, 37, and Christopher Robb, 35, were held in early 2020. A judge heard how industrial units at Swanson Street in Glasgow's Dalmarnock had been converted for the sophisticated drug making operation. Police seized around £500,000 worth of cannabis, as well as almost £100,000 of dirty money. The trio today admitted involvement as he appeared in the dock at the High Court in Glasgow. Gartshore and Robb had also been accused of holding named individuals in servitude to work at the units, but not guilty pleas were accepted. The three had their bail continued and are due to be sentenced in October. Prosecutor Alan Cameron told how they were part of a large-scale cannabis cultivation at several connected industrial units. He added, Gart Shore, along with others, was involved from May 17, 2019 in the setting up of the units. This initially included sourcing equipment and creating growing areas for cannabis plants. Mr Cameron, over the sub- subsequent months, he visited them obtaining necessary materials such as compost and taking cannabis away to sell. On December 30, 2019, police caught him driving a van into a car park in East Kilbride. He handed over another bag to another person in the car. This was later found to contain £53,555 of drug money. A month later, Gartshore was held by officers. He had a key for one of the units as well as £38,000 of cannabis. Blackshaw was stopped the same night after police spotted him leaving Gartshore's home in Ridry, Glasgow. Blackshaw, of the city's Nitz Hill, dropped a laundry bag causing £15,200 of cannabis. Police also found £22,000 of high-purity cocaine, as well as £66,580 of ecstasy tablets, with another £6,000 worth of cannabis found in the property. Detectives then raided the drug factory in February 1st, 2020. Mr Cameron said a load of 873 plants were found in the units, which had dozens of lights and fans rigged up. The prosecutor. The setup was a professional one, with large numbers of pots containing individual plants. The value of the cannabis seized there was more than £450,000, but Mr Cameron added, if all the recovered drugs were broken down into small quantities and or further adulterated, the maximum potential value of each would have been higher. Rob was later caught with £41,685 of drug money in Cambus Lang near Glasgow on April 8th, 2020. The trio pleaded guilty to drug supply charges with Gartshore and Robb also admitting to possessing criminal funds. Lord Scott deferred sentencing for reports, and that report was by a court reporter. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 28th of September 2022, from the news section, two men arrested for stealing a bike near Mount Florida train station. Report by Sarah Campbell. Two men have been arrested following an alleged bike theft near a Southside train station. The bike is said to have been stolen close to the Mount Florida railway station at around 4am today, Wednesday the 28th. The men, aged 31 and 15, will appear in court at a later date. Police Scotland has urged bike owners to contact their community teams about upcoming bike marking events. 
in articles by Sarah Campbell. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 28th of September 2022, from the news section, two teens arrested after breaking at coffee shop on Glasgow's Paul Shores Road by Sarah Campbell. Two teenagers have been arrested following a break-in in the city's south side. The incident is said to have taken place at a coffee shop on Paul Shaw's Road at around 11pm on Monday, September 26th. The two males, aged 16 and 17, are due in court at a later date. And that piece was by Sarah Campbell. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 28th of September 2022, from the news section, exclusive, Women's footballers forced to change on pitch at Clyde FC that signed named rapist David Goodwillie by Caroline Wilson. Women footballers were forced to change on the pitch at the Scots club that re-signed named rapist David Goodwillie according to employment tribunal papers lodged by a former coach. Lauren Rabit is suing Clyde Football Club claiming she was forced out of her post after she had concerns that the female side were facing discrimination the former footballer, who played in the US and UK, claimed she was headhunted to oversee women's and girls football, offered an agreed salary, and tasked with developing Clyde ladies and securing sponsorship. She says shortly after she started in October last year, players raised their concerns that they had no access to changing facilities and were having to change on the foot in the pitch for matches. According to the paper, she reported her concerns to David McGoldrick, Clyde ladies general manager, and Tom Elliott, Head of Community Development for the club, but said they were not fully addressed. Ms Rabit escalated the matter to Aileen Campbell, Chief Executive of Scottish Women's Football, SWF, in January, saying she was concerned about a lack of support from the club for women at large. The coach is said to have secured a major sponsorship deal for the women's team on January the 28th. Three days later, she said she received an email from David Colwell, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Clyde FC Community Foundation, who appointed her, saying a funding application for her position had been unsuccessful. She claimed she was asked by Mr Caldwell what her agenda was after she raised concerns. She says she was thereafter referred to as a volunteer and issued a statement on Twitter on March the 3rd saying she was no longer associated with Clyde FC. The previous day, the club announced the controversial re-signing of David Goodwillie, who was ruled in a civil court to have raped a woman in 2017. The general manager of the women's side, David McGoldrick, later announced his resignation and the team disbanded. Ms Rabit is suing Clyde for unfair dismissal, with other claims of sex discrimination and harassment. The club denies all the allegations and claims the former footballer was aware that she was being taken in in a voluntary capacity. It said Mr Caldwell had no authority to offer a paid position and she was taken on by the club's charitable wing. Clyde FC accepts that a level of pay was discussed, but said she was made aware that her salary was contingent on funding being sourced. The club said the women's side were not able to make use of the men's changing facilities due to COVID restrictions and said it does not have a legal responsibility to provide the team with changing rooms. It said an alternative area was identified with cubicles, toilets and heating, but claims this was declined by the coach. Clyde said it was aware that Ms Rabbit had sta- stated in the media that her resignation was in response to the signing of David Goodwillie. The club said its purpose is at senior semi-professional men's football team. It said discussions had been had about creating a senior women's football team, but this was viewed as a potential goal for the future. The employment tribunal is due to get underway in November. And that article was an exclusive by Caroline Wilson. And that was this week's Glasgow Times News Podcast, normally recorded in our studio at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre, currently recorded from our volunteers' homes with the publisher's kind permission. Thanks for listening.